Uh, good evening. Good evening. That was a lot better. It was really loud in the last video. Just so you guys know, if you guys watched it, it was actually kind of funny. Um, that's the way I came up, and it started, and it got really loud on that second one. But I'm encouraged to come before you to, to actually finish First Timothy. We are on the last two verses, and uh, congratulations, you survived. We survived. Uh, we dealt with so many different topics. Um, some were uncomfortable for me to preach, but very much a benefit, I would believe, to all of us. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we are on the last two verses of this book. So let me read that, and we'll pray once more. O Timothy, God what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter, and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. Let's pray. Lord, as we approach your holy scriptures, I pray now that you would bring clarity, that your Holy Spirit would teach us, that as we expound, um, in a sense, together as I speak, that the words that would come from my mouth would be um, words that you would want to address to your church. Lord, so we entrust to you all this time in ourselves, our minds, and our hearts, and all that it worships within us. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. The title of the sermon is A Guarded Treasure. A Guarded Treasure. If I was debating if I was going to go through a whole overview of the whole book of First Timothy, and I thought to myself, well, I think it would probably be really redundant. In that moment that we went through it, I, I know that the Lord sovereignly orchestrated us to go through those portions of Scripture. Oddly enough, the times that we were going through those portions of Scripture, it seemed as though, well, it seemed as though, it actually was some of the things that we were personally going through. And by the Lord's providence, he ministered to us, he ministered to me. Um, and now we get to the end of this book, and, and once again, I thought to myself, do I go that route? And I said, no, I don't. I'm not going to do that. I really want to focus on the really deep wording that we see in these two verses. It's two verses, and I, as I was studying it, I was like, well... This will be probably one of the shorter sermons. It'll be 30, 35 minutes. It'll seem like a devotional. And then when I started, it turned into just, it was its own animal. And the Lord really took me back to the main reason for the whole book. Turn back with me to, to chapter 1. Before I read any portion of the scripture from chapter 1, you see that he says, Timothy, there's a deposit that I have entrusted to you, Timothy. And this deposit came really early in the book. If, if, and it's been weeks now, right, that we've been through it. So we thought, okay, well, they're not going to remember. So what is, it that, what is this deposit that he actually front-loaded in the book itself? And then he repeats it again in the last two verses. In the last two verses, it, it's almost like a succinct view of the whole book, the whole letter, the whole of what he was trying to say through the whole book. But what is this view? And what is this treasure entrusted to Timothy? Look at verse 18, chapter 1. This command I entrust to you, Timothy. My son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. This is a repeated thing, right? You know, we I went through that one sermon with you, and I, I it was entitled "The Fight Worth Having," right? And this treasure entrusted to him, and this fight worth having for, has always been the gospel. Look at verse 15, same chapter, 1 Timothy 1, 15. 
It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is the treasure that Paul says, I have placed before you, Timothy. I deposit this within you. And this is what I entrust to you that I, I want you to cherish above all else. And then he goes through the whole book and it would seem like he's tackling through the whole book so many gospel issues within the church itself. But it goes right back to the same thing. It's front-loaded. Christ came into the world to save sinners. The minister's main calling is that he would guard the clear understanding of the gospel. But before I make that point, I'll come back to this. Go back to chapter 6. Still by way of introduction, these days we live in a, for some of you older people, you will, you'll understand this, we live in a, in a type of a Burger King kind of world. I want it my way, society. Uh, we, are, we are treated like consumers in every way. The consumer is always right. The customer is always right is that the mantra. We cater, we tailor to everything. Everything. If it feels good, it must be right, is one of the mantras we would say, right? The idea that the heart knows what it wants. You can't go against the heart. This is the what the church has also adapted. I'm not talking about faithful churches, but churches and pastors have tragically fallen for this pragmatic approach to, to ministry. They ask the world, what do you want from church? What do you want from church? And the, and the world says, well, I want a feeling of community. And the church does give that. I want encouragement. Yeah, the church gives that also. I want programs. I want hip, pop, Worship music. I want a euphoric experience. I want to walk away feeling like, wow, like I'm floating. And I would say when the world asks for these things, and, and, and who wouldn't ask for those things, right? And the church decides to front, put that in the forefront. When they put those things in the forefront, they remove the gospel. Because there's no space for it. So church has become the Burger King, like I said, and has forgotten the King of Kings. The purpose of the church has always been the worship, the preaching of God's word. It's not about men. The consumer of church and the consumer of worship, there's only one consumer, and it is God. So if you come here for a different purpose, then it's not worship. If you don't understand this, um, I entrust to you that by the time I'm done, you will understand this. I prayerfully you will understand this. You will understand that Paul gives this exhortation to Timothy to guard it, to guard the gospel itself. And hopefully by word, when we're done here, and if you know Christ, you will understand that this has been entrusted to you also. The gospel itself has been entrusted to you and deposited in you. Look at chapter 6. Chapter 6, and I want you to just focus on one thing. Verse 20, the middle of the verse, it says, avoiding. Before I actually get to the portion of what we're entrusted to guard, I want to warn you on what to avoid. And there's only three points to this, and the sub-points of avoiding is this, is the twin chatters the contradictions, and the false knowledge. 
the twin chatters, the contradictions, and the false knowledge. Paul begins this way. You notice that he says, Oh, Timothy. I don't know if you know this, but like, you know, moms in the home, when the kids are in trouble, um, the moms will get those, they'll say every name of the kid, right? Like, we have this in our home, like Mona, when she's upset with Ethan, she's like, Ethan Samuel Galvez, come over here right now. Mercy Christine Galvez, like, like we don't know each other's names, right? It's like, Mercy Christine Galvez. But you know when she says that, like, she's upset. Now, Timothy is not being rebuked by Paul, but he is, Paul is adding, O Timothy. And the point of this is this, is listen up, Timothy. What I'm about to tell you is a summary of the whole book and the point of exactly what I want you to walk away with, because when you finish this book, when you finish this letter I've written to you, and you don't get the main point, the whole reason for the, for the letter will be lost. So he tells them, Oh, Timothy, listen up, Timothy. The urgency in his clo- closing is, is loaded and clear. First point, twin chatter. The twin chatter that you see here, it says, Oh, Timothy, guard what was entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter. The word in the Greek for for chatter is babel, right? But before I explain more of what chatter is and what worldly chatter is, let me give you the end of and the production of worldly and empty chatter. Look at, go one page over to 2 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. Here's the same word. It says, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. So the warning is this. Before I even start reading what chatter is, what empty chatter, what worldly chatter is, let me tell you that the only end of it, and the the obvious always, this will always happen, is what it will cause ungodliness. It will never drive you to righteousness. So now that we know this, and we know the end of it, this type of speech that has no, this is a type of speech that has no real substance. Empty words with zero depth. Okay? The topic of it is worldly. It may sound godly, but it's not based on any kind of truth found in Scripture. You see this in a ton of modern preaching, right? You've experienced this for yourself. I know some of you have. Example. You listen to these sermons. It has um, witty remarks and maybe things that rhyme. And you're thinking, wow, that's really smart. That, that rhymes, that, that, sounds, that sounds like something of substance, but it's not. Let me read to you some of, I won't tell you who this is, because it's not like it's slander, but I won't tell you who this preacher is. But I'm going to give you just within the titles themselves of some of these preachers, okay? So let me read to you some of the titles. Find purpose in your passion. It says, this is another title, it says, Decide where you want to win. Another title, When the Battle Chooses You. Wow, that sounds great, right? This is a weird one. Make peace, right, peace, with your missing pieces. It's so cringy. Um, it said, there's another one. Move in what you're made for. Here's another title. Yes, you. That's it. Another one. That's not all you are. Okay. 
Check this one out. What it means is up to me. Did you hear that? What it means is up to me. These are real titles. You understand this? This is not made up. And it didn't take long for me to actually go to the website and look at these titles and go, oh, wow, like every single one of them is bad. No depth, no meaning, no talk of God. If you notice something, it's really all about you. Words without a point. I'm sure if the title is empty, then the message is nonsense. Don't fall for it. You may have walked away motivated, per se, but not transformed. Because you didn't hear the Word of God, the living Word of God expounded to you. Keep in mind that this is also, in context, in private conversation. Don't get dragged into them. Don't get dragged into these conversations that have zero depth, have arguments that don't matter. And if you do get dragged into it, bring it right back to the gospel. This is what has been entrusted to you. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Here's another exhortation. Verse 13. Retain the standard of sound words, which you have heard from me, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us a treasure which has been entrusted to you. This is in private conversation. This is over the pulpit. Obviously, Paul is talking to a fellow preacher. Second point. The contradictions. He puts it this way in, in chapter 6, verse 20. He calls it, and the opposing arguments. Opposing arguments can be translated contradictions. These are, from the Greek, it's, it's where we derive the word antithesis. Antithesis. Then why is that so hard to say? Antithesis. In debates, or it's, it's a... The counter, the counter argument, the counter proposition. But these arguments, most of the time, are very are self defeating. Paul's mind is on the false teachers of Ephesus when he talks about this, and these false teachers were in opposition to the gospel itself. It wasn't just a little squimish over, you know, doctrine that is is the finer points. But it was an actual attack upon the gospel itself. Contradictions that, that a true believer, when it is, these, these things are attacked, you, you, you can't help but react. The arguments posed as intelligent, kind of like this. I mean, if these sound smart, right? I mean, uh, up front, they seem, they seem really smart. I know mean, you heard this before. It's like, what if, what if God made a rock so big that He couldn't lift it? And you pause and I'm like, that sounds really stupid. Then why would a perfect God do that? Is that a serious argument? He says, what if you're wrong about God? That's not an argument. The, the truth that we derive, it's outside of ourselves. If we had to be really clear about something. It's not what you derive and you contrive in your mind. It's, it's This truth is outside of ourselves. It's right here. Right? If it doesn't come from here, then and you're making it up as you go, then you're the arbitrator. You are the last authority to what you believe. The contradictions within your own mind are endless. You know, we have this idea, it's like people come to you and go, well, if I share the gospel with you and I tell you, you must repent, 
the way you're living is absolutely wrong, not based in my opinion, but based on the word of God. And they say, you shouldn't go around telling people that they're wrong. Really? You just didn't notice what you did right there? So let me ask you a question, I would say. Is it wrong that you're telling me that I'm wrong? You don't understand that you contradict yourself. When you tell me, when I invade your understanding within your own mind, and you tell me I am not allowed to do that, you're telling me that I'm not allowed to do something that you don't want me to do. But that's not the way the world works. If that's the way it worked, all of you that have raised children would have to, do, have to let them do whatever they wanted. And that creates chaos. Now you raise a grown child, and this child has been raised this way where nothing is wrong, and then they grow up to be these horrible people, people with no morals, no guidance, obviously, from here. They're figuring things out for themselves. The contradictions multiply and compound within them. But this is what the argument was that Paul was telling Timothy. He says, look, move away from this. Man's knowledge cannot accomplish the things of God. You know, I remember I had a conversation recently and someone said, well, what if Jesus was just a man? And they assumed that I was supposed to defend what they just said. I was supposed to contradict what they just said. And I paused and I said, well, this is your statement. Why don't you defend it? Well, they can't. Argument's over. I, no one's got time for this. I definitely don't. Third point, false knowledge. Which is opposing arguments and what is falsely called knowledge. The Greek is, is pretty, pretty great. It talks about um, laying hold of, um, taking name, taking claim to a name. So it's saying falsely and it's saying it's taking the name of knowledge. But it's not knowledge. The false teachers of Ephesus and all the false teachers of today have a lot in common. They both lay claim to a high and secret knowledge of God. They have, in a sense, a commonality with even Gnostics. This was the first battle that came into the church. You see it right away in all the epistles that the Gnostics come in. They say, we have a secret knowledge. First Thessalonians was talking about a secret knowledge that Christ had already come back. And all the believers were all in an uproar saying like, man, is, did he come back and we're not, we were left? Then the Galatians, and they thought that they had a higher form of godliness and it was just legalism. It's the Gnostic ideas. Those that claim secret revelation or special revelation, they don't understand that they do damage to the gospel itself. Even in our own history here in the United States and even world history, we see the, the age of enlightenment. And then from there you see modernism and then postmodernism. And from there, I mean, we really get what we see now, like secular humanism. And then we think to ourselves, like, okay, well, that's this is knowledge, guys. We understand the Enlightenment brought a lot of really great things. It brought medicine and technology. We're not going against that. The part of the Enlightenment and postmodernism, or modernism and postmodernism, and then humanism, is this, that it shakes a fist at God. And it says, I am God. I am the arbitrator of my own life. And then man decides for himself what is right. And then Romans 1 and Romans 2 and Romans 3. What did we get from the Enlightenment? What did we get from 
secular humanism and postmodernism. Let me tell you two things that we got from these things. Liberalism and communism. How many of you guys like those things? Are those beautiful things? Liberalism that wants to steal your children away. Communism that says, I don't know, if you have something, I should have it too. Really? These ideas essentially made God, little g, and canceled God. We must not entertain these false this false knowledge, a knowledge devoid of Holy Scripture, devoid of what God has already told us. Look at Second Timothy chapter two again with me. This is what God says where we should actually derive our our knowledge from it, right? It says, says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Accurately handling the word of truth. Jot this down, Romans 12, 16. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony, testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Man, if that's true, I'm okay with being called simple. Psalm 119.1, how blessed are those who, whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Romans 1. Let me turn there, actually. You guys want to turn to Romans 1 with me? Romans 1. I really want us to see this for ourselves, but take a look at this. Romans 1, verse 21. For even though they knew God, this is the same word for knowledge that is used in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. They knew God. They did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their, in their speculations or in their minds, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise they became fools. Uh, I don't know. Raise your hand if you want to be a fool. I didn't think so. None of us want to be categorized in that. But it says here that if you do not know God rightly and honor Him and give thanks, you are foolish. And how do you know God? This is this is the only way you know who how who he is in his character in his attributes. Let me read to you Proverbs 3. You guys know this portion of scripture. Proverbs 3 starting in verse 5. It says trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I mean you see these everywhere, right? You probably have like a hobby lobby placard at your house. Let me keep going. <laughs> Because there's more to this. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It's The word never fails. It searches our hearts. And if you're a believer here, you understand exactly what I'm saying. This resonates with your spirit because the spirit of God resides in you. But if it doesn't, then you do not understand this treasure. Let me close with this. Turn, turn back to 1 Timothy.
I'm going to go through a few scriptures here, but just follow, follow along with me here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Let me, let me describe to you something that, I, that I, I pray that you would identify yourself with this. That you would, you would agree and you would amen with Paul in this. That Paul describes himself in three ways. He says, I was a blasphemer, blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. This is a simple acknowledgement that Paul is a sinner. But the Apostle Paul, for us former Catholics, St. Paul says... This is what he was. And he still says, I am the foremost of sinners. Later on in this chapter. He acknowledges his, his own sin. And this is the problem with this world. That it doesn't see itself as sinning before a holy God. Turn back with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. You have no excuse. It doesn't, God does not believe in atheists. There are no atheists in God's mind because he has made himself known to all men and all men are without excuse. Chapter 3, Romans 3, 21. says, But now apart from the law of righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You have a witness with the Old Testament, the law of God, the prophets that have proclaimed God's truth, Verse 22, even, even the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, through faith in, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God has leveled the playing field. Listen, God has leveled the playing field for everyone. At the foot of the cross, you are at level. You are not higher, you are not lower. You are all under the same judgment. And he says, at that same foot of the cross, will you turn your back or will you turn to the cross? Turn to Luke, Luke chapter 5. Love the way Christ put it because... You know, because those red-letter words mean more. I'm kidding. Luke 5, verse 30. Christ is having this conversation with the Pharisees and the scribes. These men that, that are self-righteous. These men that don't believe that they're sinners. They're not willing to acknowledge, like Paul did, that he's a blasphemer or persecutor. And he says this to them. He says, the Pharisees and their scribes, began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? How dare you reach out to these lost sinners? This is what Christ's response is. Brilliant. And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to the to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. This is the clause. Everyone is a sinner. He's trying to reveal to them, even in the moment that these self-righteous Pharisees that see themselves as perfect in the law, they don't need Christ, but they do need Christ. Turn back to 1 Timothy Chapter 6. Actually, I'm sorry. Chapter 1. 
Let me read the rest of Paul's account of himself. Second part of 13, verse 13. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord has more was more than abundant with the faith and love which is found in Christ Jesus. Look at the words, mercy, grace, and love. Mercy, grace, and love. These are the foundational words that you find in the gospel itself. And Jesus demonstrates this. Look at verse 16. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost of sinners, this is what he's saying, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Christ came to save sinners. Don't get the truth twisted. The gospel is not about you. You benefit from the gospel. You are not the center of the gospel. He came to save sinners. Do you see yourself as a sinner? Are you the Pharisee grumbling and pointing to other Christians and saying, oh, look, he's self-righteous, he's self-righteous. But you can't turn the finger to yourself and say, I, I, I'm a persecutor. I have persecuted. I am the aggressor. I hate God. Can you say that? Because if you're going to be truthful about anything, come to that position and tell yourself, God is holy. I stand judged. And without Christ, I am damned to hell. Christ demonstrates mercy, grace, and love. Do you reject that? Be sure of one thing that if you come to Christ, you come empty-handed. You have no grip on your sin, no grip on anything else that you consider God. God will not take any substitutes. He will not work against the glory of something else in your mind or in your heart. Think of verse 17. This is how he ends this portion. He says, Now to the King Eternal, Christ Himself, Immortal, Invisible, the only God. And can you say this for yourself? Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The message entrusted to Timothy was this gospel. You are called to respond. Turn. Repent. And for those of you that do believe, this gospel has been entrusted to you. Not to keep to yourself. But that others would benefit from the mercy and the love and the grace found in Christ alone. Let's pray.